Thanks, Dean Phillips. We do have some great events slated for the spring, and uh, I'm going to plug those in a minute. Uh, but I, and I am so happy to see uh, some students here, and actually many of my students, so thanks for coming. Uh, we also have some uh, other esteemed guests, some uh, faculty, and some board members from the IEC. So happy to see you here as well. And I want to acknowledge our chairman, Kyle Dixie, and let him come up and say a few words. Thank you, Peter. I uh, would reflect what the dean had said earlier in terms of us being excited about all of this uh, going forward throughout the year. Uh, definitely do three things. One, follow us on LinkedIn. Two, uh, follow us on Instagram. And then third, if you can, uh, donate to the IEC because it definitely <laughs> helps us put up programs like this. So all you have to do is go to clu.edu slash innovation. There's a link there to click to donate. So definitely give that some consideration after watching the program today. Thank you, everyone. OK, now I have to put my glasses back on. So uh, what we're going to do today, I'm going to give a brief introduction, and then I'm going to let Audrey tell her story, and then Audra and I are gonna chat for a little while, and then I'm gonna give you a chance to ask Audra some questions, which I'm sure you're anxious to do. So uh, first, I'm so happy that we have a wonderful Seattle University alumna and a working entrepreneur with us here tonight. So currently, Audra is the president, president and the founder of Girl Meets Dirt, and Orcas Island based fruit preserves and winery, specializing in heirloom, jams, shrubs, bitters, and petalin. I practiced that word all day today. <laughs> Natural made from heritage island fruit. Uh, petalin is the bitter. Petna. Pet say petna. 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 It's, a, petna. it's an all natural sparkling wine. I knew I did that wrong. You can okay. say that instead. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> So she's a graduate of Seattle University with a degree in economics and two minors in English and history. And she started her career as an analyst at Credit Suisse First Boston. Uh, she has a story about this related to one of our guests, but I'm gonna let her tell it. She went on to a successful career in Wall Street with all the big name firms. Uh, you'll recognize some of these, Credit Suisse, JP Morgan, Merrill Lynch, Goldman Sachs, wow. And along the way, she earned a master's in quantitative methods from Columbia University with a strong research interest in environmental responsibility. And lucky, lucky for us, she came home to, to the Pacific Northwest to be an entrepreneur. And uh, she is based up on Orcas, and she has served on Seattle University's alumni, alumni Board of Governors, and she's very active, a very active member of the Orcas Island community. And, a number of ways as an entrepreneur and as a community member. And I'm really just scratching the surface here, but we're so lucky to have Audra here to tell her story firsthand. And so on behalf of the IEC and Albers and Seattle University, I'm pleased to introduce Audra Lawler of Girl Meets Dirt. that I'm the original girl of Girl Meets Dirt because there are a lot of girls and boys and uh, all sorts of uh, staffers who are part of the team now. Um, so we constantly have people going around the shop, they show up at our floor, are you the girl? <laughs> to my sales manager, are you the girl? To my team manager, are you the girl? I just say, yeah, tell them, yes, I'm the girl. We're all the girl. Um, but I'm the OG of Girl Meets Dirt. Um, I, uh, my story is very non-traditional <laughs> in terms of how I wound up running a fruit preserves business on Orcas Island. Um, but in hindsight, a series of small and big decisions led me to exactly where I am today, um, uh, running this business now for um, eight years. So rewind a little bit. Um, I'll tell you about a little bit how I got there. Well, first, actually, I'll start and tell you just a little bit about what Girl Meets Dirt is for those who aren't familiar. We are a fruit preserves company based on Orcas Island and the San Juan Islands. Um, anyone know where the San Juan Islands are? <laughs> Beautiful place. If you haven't been, definitely go visit. 
A um, little hard to do from a day trip from Seattle. You drive about an hour and a half north to Anacortes and take a ferry. It is a ferry service island. Do not take your car thinking that you can drive out a bridge to Orcas Island because you cannot. Um, but that's kind of the beauty of the place. Uh, it keeps the population down, um, keeps the whales there, um, and makes it just a really special uh, place to get away or a place to live. Um, we specialize in, uh, our tagline is heritage preserves. Um, we use the term preserves broadly. Uh, if you um, enjoyed some of the crostini and cheese, you may have sampled some of our line. Uh, we have a line of jams called spoon preserves and cutting preserves, tailored for cheese and charcuterie pairings. Um, the little squat jars um, are called cutting preserves. They're smooth, thick, and dense, and perfect for your cheese boards and grazing trays. The spoon preserves are like a traditional jam, very fruit forward, lots of chunks of fruit. Those are like a traditional jam and we market them that way. However, we found over the years as we work with different retailers, um, we sell best in the cheese section. So that's where we try and get our placement. We kind of die a quick death if we're in the jam aisle, partially because of our price point, um, which is quite high uh, compared to our competitors. Um, you're welcome to ask me some questions about our thinking on that later, but um, it's diving into the weeds. Uh, we also have um, a line of shrubs, which a lot of you are enjoying the sparkling water. water. They are sweet and sour syrups tailored for homemade cocktails and mocktails. Uh, some people also sip them. It's a colonial era recipe that they used to use to preserve fruit juice before the era of mass refrigeration. They would basically spike it with something acidic, um, mainly apple cider vinegar, and that's what we use. Uh, but they're partially fermented, um, really great for um, home cocktailing. Um, we also have several bars who buy them by the growler and serve them in their cocktail program in their bars and restaurants. And then this past year, oh, sorry, also I forgot to bring them, but we have a line of bitters as well, um, which are made for using in classic cocktails. A lot of people also dash them into sparkling water. All of our product line has really, um, I didn't start out saying, I'm gonna make cutting preserves and spoon preserves and shrubs and bitters, and then I'm gonna start a winery seven years in. Um, the inspiration behind the business was really the heritage orchards of Orcas Island. Um, I was born and raised in Washington State, in Vancouver, went to school in Seattle, moved to New York, had an accidental career on Wall Street for 10 years. It was soul sucking, but I learned a lot. <laughs> and gave up everything, sold everything, moved cross country with my new husband, bought five acres on Orcas, and said to myself, what now? <laughs> What am I gonna do now? Um, I need to make a living. I really didn't wanna go back into finance. I wanted to do something really different. Um, the property we bought, the main reason I bought it is because it had a garden. Um, and in that garden was where Girl Maester was born. Uh, it's the beginning of this business is the literal story of me getting in the garden, getting my hands dirty. Girl needs dirt. Um, I spent two years teaching myself how to grow things from seed. I had a greenhouse. Um, I grew almost all the fresh food that we ate, and I became obsessed with learning how to make everything. We had chickens, I would make mayonnaise, I would make ice cream, um, I was making pestos, and then I started canning when I, my, my vegetable produce was high, and the property also had um, 10 fruit trees. So when the, fruits, uh, the trees started bearing their fruit, uh, there was a shiro plum tree, an Italian plum tree, an orcas pear tree, several other pear trees, the one shiro plum tree in late July yielded over 100 pounds of plums. I started picking them. And this was just my husband and I at the time. I didn't have kids. Like, what am I gonna do with all these plums? I've always had a sweet tooth. I love making things. The highlight of my weekends in New York was going to the Union Square Farmer's Market and getting fresh produce and making a big meal for my friends. But I was like, this is a lot. <laughs> um, out of necessity and because I love a good challenge, I taught myself how to make jam. Uh, I bought a beautiful copper pot, mainly because I love poetry and it was really romantic and beautiful. Um, so I bought this copper pot and taught myself the French confiture method of making jam. I bought all the books because I'm very research oriented. I probably even had an Excel, I'll, I'll tell you one funny thing. I had an Excel spreadsheet for my garden, which my <laughs> lady friends at Marcus thought was really, really funny. <laughs> but it made me feel comfortable. Um, so I would spend late nights uh, tinkering with different jam recipes um, and I really fell in love with it. Uh, so then the Italian plums came in, so I started making jam with the Italian plums. Um, there was this combination of things being just technical enough, but also um, really lyrical and, and creative. Uh, jams, there is a certain science to some types of jams, but most of it is actually just rolling with the fruit because you can't control, especially if you're not buying 
commercial, commercially graded fruit, um, you can't control what you have to deal with until it's in your pot, uh, the water content, the acidity, how much sugar you need to add. Um, we don't add pectin, um, and I didn't from the beginning. I never really experimented much with it, so I was literally just reacting to what the fruit brought to me. Um, I fell in love with that, started giving it away just to friends, sharing it. Um, at that point, it still had never crossed my mind to actually sell the stuff, um, but I had a lot of it. I had this pantry, and my husband would invite everyone to come over, he'd joke around, say, doomsday, you know where to come, come to our pantry. Um, and eventually, friends started saying, hey, really, this is really good. You should have you thought about selling this. I was like, me, a jam maker? <laughs> no, no. But they kept saying it, they kept saying it. Um, and along the lines, uh, I started talking to, to folks in the community. There was an older couple who were my neighbors, um, and they had the property contiguous to ours. And I'd always noticed a string of fruit trees um, that looked quite old on their property. And they confronted me one day and said, hey, you know, we have all these pear trees. Do you want to make jam out of pears? I was like, sure, I mean, I'll have some. I'm not selling it, so I don't really know what to do with much. But, um, I said, these trees look old. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, it turns out it's um, 13 of the original trees from plantings back in the late 1800s yeah. um, on their property. Um, and they said, yeah, Orcas was a major fruit producing region in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Didn't you know that? No, I had no idea. I just moved here. At that point, I'd been there about a year. So I started digging around, went to the historical museum, um, and realized that Orcas was indeed a major fruit producing region um, in the early 1900s. That's when the wheels started turning. So I started looking around and I started seeing these old fruit trees everywhere. And then noticing throughout the season a whole bunch of fruit underneath the trees just that the deers were eating. Um, and as I started talking to people, people were like, yeah, I have 10 trees in my backyard. God, we don't know what to do with all this fruit. Like, yeah, it just drops to the ground. And I'm thinking, hmm. <laughs> That's when my economics brain, uh, the light bulb went off. And I said, maybe it isn't such a bad idea to be a jam maker. Um, at the same time, I was having, uh, my husband and I were trying to start a family and we were struggling. Uh, we suffered many losses before I became pregnant with my son. And so I, to some extent, really decided to launch the business at a point in my life where I was suffering lots of loss and didn't think I was ever gonna be a mom, which is what I really had moved to Orcas to, to do eventually. Um, so I say the business was my first baby. Uh, I launched it between miscarriage number four and five. Um, after that light bulb went off, realizing that there was an opportunity, an economic opportunity here to make use of something that was not being utilized, and also a really beautiful story to tell, which um, spoke to the side of me that's kind of poetic and also would love to one day write a book. Um, so, launched the business. Uh, I like to say I launched it around my Thanksgiving table in November of 2013. Uh, my family was up, my sister, my brother, my mom, my dad and I brought the inaugural 12 cases of jam to the table, and before we broke bread, I said, everybody stop what you're doing and label this jam. <laughs> my mom was the best. My sister got kicked out after her first case because she couldn't put on a label straight. So I had really great support early on. Um, my mom did think I was crazy. She was like, what exactly are you planning to do on Orcas Island? <laughs> well, I'm gonna sell, I'm gonna make jam and sell. First two seasons, it was just me. Um, I didn't start the business wanting just a farmer's market business, craft business, artisan business. I only wanted, I had always been interested in being an entrepreneur, more for the flexibility that it purportedly offered um, than the reality of it, which I've actually learned. Um, but uh, I, uh, um, I just lost my train of thought, excuse me. Um, well, this is a good place for me to interject that. <laughs> I'm rambling. Well, so uh, I wanted to hear about how you decided to go to New York. Because you're an entrepreneur now, but you were in the corporate grind, and a lot of these students you know, are, are, are facing that choice. So tell us that story. Sure. So how I wound up in New York is the result of one simple conversation that I had with my um, economics professor and mentor at the time, Dean Peterson, who's in the room. <laughs> he changed my life. <laughs> Here's that. Um, it was the spring of my junior year, and I sat 
sat down with Dean and was just kind of shooting some ideas around about some potential summer internships. And at the time, I was studying economics and I was studying Spanish and was really interested in Latin American economic development. Um, and Dean was like, you know, I have a friend, a friend from grad school, Joe Petrie, he's doing something in New York, Latin America, Latin American development, economics, something. Let me, let me give him a call. Well, a day later, I get a call from a, a very brusque and hurry, Joe Petrie. It's Joe, Joe Petrie, Credit Suisse First Boston. Dean Peterson giving your number. I'm looking for another analyst. I'm going to have my assistant Lisette call you. Click. I was like, what? I mean, I was a West Coast girl. I was pretty laid back. I mean, it was an overachiever, but laid back. This guy was intense. Lisette called me. She was much nicer. <laughs> and Lisette was like, yeah, so Joe wants to interview you. We're going to get you on a plane out to New York. Can you come two days from now? OK. <laughs> Um, flew out to New York, first time I'd ever been to New York. They put me up in a hotel in Times Square. It was the craziest whirlwind 24 hours of my life. I had to Google what an investment bank was. I had never <laughs> taken a finance class in my life. I, I was studying economics, very interested in that, but I was more interested in the theoretical side of things. So that, um, this, was, this was totally new to me. Sat down for you know half an hour interview with Joe Petrie, who turned out to be a very nice and intelligent man. Um, and are you, you know, you're studying economics, okay, that sounds good. I mean, Dean gave you a good recommendation. Okay, well, I could use another analyst. I've got these two PhD students, PhD econ students who will be working for me this summer. You want the job? Okay, great. I got slotted into one of these investment banking analyst programs without even really knowing it. In fact, I didn't even know that there were such programs until I was out there interviewing for one. Um, and these programs were the things that like my, my peers who were going to Ivy League schools had been like, had their sights set on them for years and I just got kind of in the back door. Um, so I moved out to New York in June uh, and spent the summer interning with Joe Petrie's team which ended up being a team um, running Latin American sovereign strategy on the trading floor at Credit Suisse First Boston. Um, Thank God I was working with those two econ PhD students because they helped keep it real for me. They kind of like took me under their wings um, and showed me around and, and taught me what I was supposed to be doing. I was basically, I ended up doing something that was more in my wheelhouse. It was kind of economic research support. Um, and that team was basically supporting government uh, investors in Latin American government debt. So it was a fascinating summer. It was really hard, it was really lonely. Um, when I came back to finish my senior year at SU, I did get an offer to come back after I graduated. Um, and I reluctantly said yes, because I felt like it was an opportunity I couldn't pass up. I still knew this wasn't my path or my passion, but I had learned so much and it opened my eyes to this world that, this world of, of money, essentially, that I, um, I had never experienced before. I just felt like I, I had no choice but to say yes. So I said yes, moved out in um, June 2001 to New York City. Um, which is also a very, a couple months later, a very difficult time to be in New York. Um, and started working for Credit Suisse, uh, that time in their Latin American economics group. So I was doing direct support for macroeconomic research, which I did enjoy a little bit more. Um, I quit after two years, uh, tried to move back to the West, um, and um, a boyfriend got in the way of that and uh, wound up buying some time by doing a master's at Columbia, trying to rebrand myself and get into a different field away from finance. Um, almost took a job in an environmental economics consultancy out in San Francisco, came in second for that job, so decided oh, I'll just take this one interview with this gentleman who runs the currency group over at JP Morgan. Took the interview, the offer was something I just couldn't, couldn't say no to. I said, I'll do this for two years, I'll pay off my grad school debt. Um, wound up on a team with great people in uh, foreign currency sales at J.P. Morgan. And um, five months into being there, the entire team, this is when the market was still hopping, the entire team got what they call airlifted over to Merrill Lynch to start a new business. And for some reason, they took me, the new associate, with them. Um, and at Merrill, we were starting a group that focused on um, supporting middle market companies in designing risk management programs using derivatives. So that's when I learned about, the reason I stuck with the Merrill Lynch move is because they basically let me head a business learning how to market interest rate derivatives to middle market companies while at the same time I was learning what an interest rate derivative was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was great, as I was learning, I was teaching other people. Um, so I, I stayed in that for a couple of years and then again, once again, tried to reposition myself and move out to San Francisco and had a job offer with Wells Fargo and their currency group um, in San Fran to at least get myself out west and my future husband then came in the way of that plan um, and did and I love you, please stay and I then um, wound up 
uh, taking interviews with Goldman and finished my career at Goldman. So I spent my last two years at Goldman Sachs on their um, doing this, doing this, a, a similar role, but I was in marketing interest rate and currency derivatives to middle market companies. Um, started, uh, if, if you know your financial history, I started in uh, like September 2nd, 2008. So my first 10 days on the job were very, very exciting <laughs> as the world imploded. Um, so I stuck around for a couple of years, and when I had met my said future husband, I had put a nun to his head and said, seriously, I'm not sticking around to it unless you promise to move out west, like, as soon as possible. Um, he kept a promise that God knows at the time, he really, I'm not sure he really ever thought he could keep it, but he promised. Um, he's from Ireland, and um, when it came to about, we got married in Roach Harbor, which is on San Juan Island, in um, September of 2010, and within two weeks of being back from that, uh, we started dropping the idea of, you know what? Like, I was telling him, I, I was quitting. I was going to quit that bonus season anyways. And um, and I was like, you know, it's time to move out west. It's time to do this. He was unwinding a business he was involved in, so it was the right time. So we thought, well, we'll move to San Francisco. Well, if we move to San Francisco, we're, gonna, we're probably going to get sucked back into finance anyways. Um, high cost of living. We're going to end up in the same grind. Well, let's move to Portland or Seattle. He's like, Kind of provincial, like I don't know. Well, why not? No, why not the islands? Why don't we move to San Juan? Why not Orcas? Well, why not? We had no idea what we were doing. Um, we did have a little bit of money to invest, so very quickly we decided. Well, he he um, took up. He I was still working at the time, so he flew out and met my dad on the island and started looking at real estate, and that was kind of what sealed the deal. It was a really good time to buy in the market. Um, and he uh, studied up the real estate market and we decided we were gonna buy something and whether it became our home or an investment property, in fact, I don't even think there was Airbnb, but VRBO, um, we figured it was probably a smart investment. So uh, we bought something in December of 2010 and I quit in February and we moved out right after that, um, moved back to Burkings, moved cross country. And the day, I remember the day I arrived on Orcas Island, driving down the road, and it was a dreary, classic Pacific Northwest day. It was terrible. But I, I, I drove into the property, and I was like, I'm never leaving. Like, I have to make this work, because I'm never leaving. That's great. So let's talk about what it's like to be an entrepreneur on, in the islands. I mean, it's not the center Where of everything. It's lovely, of course, but it's, uh, it must be hard to be so far away from everything far away from the resources you need. And uh, tell us a little bit about what that's like. So aside from the light bulb going off with the, the, the smart idea to weave a beautiful story around um, sourcing from heritage orchards and revitalizing an old orchard industry, the practicalities of being an entrepreneur, not just building but scaling a business on Orcas, are really, really challenging. Um, I did have some foresight at the beginning Obviously, I'm a, I'm a relatively smart individual, I think, but I've made my fair share of mistakes. So I was really careful at the beginning to, I think, and uh, eight years in and being profitable is a testament to that, price it properly into our, um, the economics of our business. Um, I took, I, I spent some time, I went to the Specialty Food Association meetings um, in San Francisco. I remember the most pivotal moment of my career was taking a class on I can't remember, it was, it, was, it was like pricing for the specialty food industry where they taught me how to like understand. And even though I had worked in finance, like I didn't have any experience with like sales margins and cost of goods sold. It was just something that was not in my wheelhouse. I was dealing with just totally different things. So I had to learn that from scratch. But um, that was the most important thing that I did early on to be able to continue growing the business was um, to have really high margins, <laughs> to be frank. Um, a lot of the challenges we run into, um, in the early days, it was uh, related to sourcing. Um, you know, I wasn't bringing in things by the pallet in the beginning, so I'd be shipping them in, and shipping things via FedEx and UPS is really expensive on and off the island. Um, it's gotten better as we've scaled because we can use our freight providers and we're moving things on and off in a pallet size. And then right now, this year, we're starting to talk truckloads. Like, we need, to, or we need to figure out how to manage a truckload of glass or a truckload of sugar and where we warehouse that. Um, so that's helped um, because over time, our costs have actually gone down, um, and I priced in pretty high costs at the beginning. Um, as of late, you know, we've had challenges related to the economic environment. Um, in, you know, this 2021 has been definitely the most challenging year yet. Uh, the 
nationwide labor shortage is real. <laughs> and for a food manufacturing business where we still make everything ourselves and it is very much handmade, so we're extremely labor dependent. Um, so labor has been our biggest challenge uh, and that's accentuated by a pretty extreme affordable housing crisis on Orcas Island, which has only gotten worse as the price of real estate has gone up. Um, so our ability to scale from here hinges on being able to have, get creative with the labor problem. Um, the last half of 2021, supply shortages have been what's been keeping me up at night. Um, we've had major issues sourcing glass. Uh, we, did, we did have foresight in early 2021. Um, and I'm not even sure why, but we decided to lock down like our glass purchases for the next nine months. Uh, so we were relatively new to it because we had, we had just put down contracts um, for the first time ever uh, to lock down some glass. But we've, faced, we've been facing up and down shortages with sugar even this week. We had to buy $2,000 worth of sugar from Costco to get us through two days, you know, because the supplier that we had, you know, wouldn't release a pallet of sugar. Um, yeah, it's real. And I, and I think as I think about growing the business and scaling from here, um, that's heavy on my mind. You know, the question of how big can we get, coupled with how big do we want to get, um, and what can this island sustain given the challenges of operating on an island? Is that the goal, to, to get big? I'm not done growing yet, yeah. I mean, we, we, we're still, uh, uh, we, we hit some pretty important revenue goals um, the year before last. Um, and then grew 35% on top of that last year. Um, I don't want to grow 35% this year because it's going to hurt too much. Um, so I'm, for quality of life reasons, I'm trying to plateau the, slow down the growth for the next two years so that I can buy myself some time to think about those really big, big questions. Because um, we're at a point where we, we um, tripled our footprint in January of 2020. Thank January 2020. January 2020, we tripled our footprint and that meant tripled my rent and then COVID hit. And it was a really scary three weeks. Um, really scary three weeks where I said, oh my God, what did I just do? Um, in the end, we ended up being uh, just fine. Um, we were an essential business, we could continue operating. Um, and at that point, labor wasn't, um, wasn't constraining us. Um, but I shut down for three weeks and furloughed my staff just to like size up what was happening and make sure I didn't need to read neg on the lease that I had just um, that I had just signed. So now, you know, fast forward two years, we're maxed out again on our capacity after tripling our space. Um, and I lease the property; I don't own it. Um, so there's only so much that we there's only so much we can expand in the current footprint. We built out a big outdoor processing area this year, which is where we did most of the winery work. And we were kind of jamming winery storage into the into the um, the jam business, um, but we're we're up to our eyeballs. You know, we we because we make everything by hand and because we source um, everything that we can from the islands and what we don't we are bringing in, but we process it all ourselves. So the fruit comes in, you know, in bins of whole fruit. Um, in order to have a year-round business where we can respond to opportunities and demand, we we prep and freeze in the fruit season. So we have right now um, four massive walk-in freezers. But to, as the business grows, it requires more freezers and more cold storage and walk-in space. Um, and I just don't have the footprint anymore. Like we, we've maxed out. I can't put it in another freezer. So. Um, I feel like this year, going into this year, there were so many capacity limitations that we were hitting. Like, I need another huge, massive walk-in freezer, like a warehouse walk-in freezer. I need, I mean, walk-in cooler. And then I need another big walk-in freezer, and we need to solve some freight issues because the freight guy can't keep up with what we need bringing our fruit in. I kind of say uncle a little bit, so I, I'm strategically trying to manage growth so that we can hopefully not make, not make more um, than we did last year. Uh, but I'm, I'm still trying for revenues. So we have, we, we made a bunch of wine last year, so we'll be selling the wine, we'll be launching it this spring. And those are already sunk costs. Um, we raised our prices also across the board in November of 2020, um, because all of our costs were going up. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> but I'd like to strategically slow things down a little bit. Um, 
shift a little bit more to an emphasis on our, and I actually didn't tell you guys like a breakdown of our business, I should share that before I get into direct to consumer, but we're actually, most people think we're just like a farmer's market mom and pop type business, but we're 75% um, wholesale and distribution. So that's really the core of our business, is working with our wholesale partners, which um, we still do all the fulfillment ourselves as well, so we make everything, we fulfill everything, aside from when we're um, shipping off to, in pallets to our distribution partners. We have four different distributors that we work with, and they service our main grocery accounts. So you can find us in the cheese sections of um, Whole Foods throughout Washington and Oregon, all the PCCs in Washington State, um, QFC uh, throughout Washington and Oregon in the JR Mile, um, Safeway, uh, in the cheese section, in the shrubs, or in the mixer set of the Safeway Seattle division, which is all throughout Washington, some of Oregon, and also parts of Alaska and Idaho, um, Market of Choice in Oregon. So those are kind of up Hagen. We're in most of the big grocers that are, are um, at least middle range and above throughout Washington state. And a lot of those are serviced through our, dis our distributor partners. Uh, but then we also do tons of drop shipping wholesale to independents across the country. Um, so 75% of that business is wholesale uh, distribution, um, and then the rest is split between retail and online. Uh, online grew quite a bit in 2020, so that was the, the, the rainbow that came out of that, is realizing that there was, um, we, had, we hadn't even scratched the surface on the direct-to-consumer stuff through our website. Um, the retail piece is us, we have a shop at the tail end of our facility, so tourists can actually come by, um, have a tasting experience, purchase our products directly, and then we still do farmer's markets, uh, the local farmer's markets. We do the Orcas Island farmer's market, we're we'll going into our 11th season, just because the way the fruit seasons work, uh, and then the Friday Harbor farmer's market. Uh, so it's always been a question, you know, do I lean more into the retail side of the business? Do I, do I lean more into online? Um, I've always been hesitant to scale the retail side at all because I knew when I started this business that I didn't want to be dependent on the ebbs and flows of the tourist economy in the islands. So many of the businesses there are built dependent on tourists. So I knew I wanted to come up with a product that can market off the island and have a sustainable business no matter what was happening with the, the economy in the islands. So this year, part of that, I, part of that strategy to um, you know, manage growth better is to lean more in for the first time, invest some money in our digital marketing strategy, for example. I'm still, I, I'm Instagram. I still, it's, the voice is me. I do our Instagram. I outsource our Facebook, you know, to somebody on my team. But um, we really haven't put any money into um, uh, digital marketing or marketing in general. Um, it's been, we've let the organic growth kind of push us along. That's amazing. So I know that the folks here have questions too. And uh, I want to invite you all to think about some questions you'd like to ask Audra while we're here. And go ahead. Yeah, um, I would like to ask what is your uh, like advice? If Because I uh, look forward to become an entrepreneur maybe in maybe like seven, eight years or something. So um, I know that the journey has been hard for you, the start especially. So there must be some uh, things which you uh, which you have thought that okay I lack here and I did some mistake here I shouldn't have done that or something like that. So I just wanted a little bit advice what to avoid or uh, maybe I can gain some experience that's uh, like you can advise that okay first it's uh, gain some experience or knowledge in this skill and then move forward that will be a better mentor for easy level. I think I have a few pieces of advice. Um, you know, I I went into this with a little bit of a cushion, intentionally, but I was also trying to do a lot of things. I knew that I couldn't throw myself into being an entrepreneur because I was also trying to be a mom. Um, and I eventually did become a mom, and I have a five and a seven-year-old now. Um, so to me, especially leaving the world of finance, I was looking at you know these female partners that I was supposed to look up to, and I didn't look up to them because I didn't want their lives. You know, I saw them like working 12-hour days and then going home and like kissing their kid kid on the forehead while they were sleeping, and not it wasn't the type of lifestyle that I wanted. So the big driver for me becoming an entrepreneur was to try and have I don't like the word balance because um, I don't really believe in work-life balance, but one wise person once said to me. There's no such thing as work-life balance, but there's a pendulum, and it swings. And that is really telling to me. So um, I became an entrepreneur because I felt like I could manage that pendulum a little bit better. 
like because I also love calling the shots. And of course, there are always external factors that push you to one side of the pendulum than the other. Um, but I really liked having more control over that. Um, so being smart about um, the entrepreneurship path in terms of maybe working in another industry and, and saving some money is, is certainly my number one piece of advice um, so that you don't have to go balls to the wall um, and feel under pressure constantly because those early years were not profitable. <laughs> um, but I knew I had a cushion and I was kind of, I was making decisions in the early years, I was making decisions like, well, okay, I can, I can hire I can hire this production manager to come in and make the jam for me, or I can make the jam, and it's going to cost me you know forty grand to have this person do this. I don't can't really afford that. The business can't really sustain that. But if I don't do that, then I'm not going to be able to be with my one year old son, and that's worth it to me. So I made my own economic calculus in my head in terms of what was important to me, um, but I can only do that because I had the funds to do that. So I really like managed the business in the early years to cater to my lifestyle and what made me happy. It's only been the past probably four years or so where you know I'm really all in on the business and it's fully running, profitable, you know, based on business decisions and not, you know, I'm not having to hire somebody because I think it will give me a ton of quality of life. Um, it's also just the business can sustain it. Um, and the other thing I would say is is there are a lot of business ideas out there, um, and I don't know a lot about them, about you know, the easy ways to make money and being an entrepreneur, but my, my truth is that I wouldn't be successful if I wasn't passionate about what I was doing. And I know I've mentioned all the challenges, but the only reason I'm still doing this is because I love what I do. And you get me in an orchard, and I light up, and I'm really excited, and I still love the story that I get to tell. And that's why I'm doing it, because I'm telling a beautiful story that I'm passionate about, and I get to share I get to be on everybody's tables, and that's really cool to me and really rewarding. Um, so to me, I, I think it's really important to find something that lights you up, because that's what's going to sustain, sustain you through the supply shortages, <laughs> through the labor shortages, um, and through the painful moments when you just want to be with your family, but you can't be with your family. Um, those would be the top, the top two things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's excellent advice. Thank you. What other questions? Anybody else? Oh, lots of questions, but I saw you first. Um, how has your work and environmental responsibilities changed how you, um, like, your work and your business? Say that one more time. How has my work responsibility changed as I've Oh, about environment. Okay, so how does how does my schooling and environmental responsibility affect my business? Great question, actually, because I didn't talk about that at all. So one of the big reasons why I was inspired by the Heritage Orchards of Orcas and this idea of building a business around um, using fruit that's gleaned and fruit that otherwise wouldn't be used is a. It's it's a beautiful story about heritage and rootedness, which is what I was searching for at that time in my life. But b. Um, it was this great um, great story about. Uh, uh, um, making the most of things, right? Uh, re reduce, reuse, recycle, that phrase. Um, so that's actually the cornerstone of our business. Um, and I meant to mention that that's where I was, when I started to talk about all our product lines, um, I mentioned that, you know, I didn't start off saying, I'm going to make spoon and cutting preserves and shrubs and bitters in the Montreal winery. Um, I started with the jams, and I was interested in making a fruit paste. So the cutting preserves are like a paste. They're styled after a Spanish membrillo or a quince paste if you've ever traveled around the world. But they're kind of, um, you find them around uh, many places now. But I wanted to make them in other flavors that I hadn't seen them before. So cutting preserves is a made up term. So I've marketed it myself. I'm still educating people on what it means. But I refuse to call it a fruit paste. When we started making those, the way that I make those, there's fruit juice as a byproduct. And for many years, that fruit juice just went down the drain. Um, and then uh, one day I was, I think I was just reading about, for some reason I, I read about colonial era beverages, um, <laughs> and stumbled across shrubs. Uh, and shrubs were actually, as I said, it's a colonial, it's actually an ancient recipe, you know, in, in um, the Far East they used to use lemon juice to preserve the fruit juice. 
Um, but they were talking about shrubs and how they used to keep a little, you know, colonial era families would keep like the tincture, the little canister of whiskey and then the canister of shrub. And you could see old pictures of like little fancy canisters with shrub in place. And I'm like, what is a shrub? Um, and I thought, wow, that, that fits really into our ethic because we're making these old school, we're marking ourselves as like old school jams and preserves, handmade, no pectin, the old school way that we used to make things. And I was like, this is old school recipe. Hmm, wonder if I can use this, use my fruit juice in this. Um, obviously, I can make a fruit syrup, but the marketing behind that wasn't very interesting. I don't use fruit syrups. They felt very old fashioned. Um, so I hit on shrubs right when they were starting to become known by, you know, kind of a niche sector of bartenders. Um, so I was like, I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna make these shrubs and I'm gonna start marketing them. Uh, so we took the fruit juice and we essentially preserved it with vinegars. We used raw white wine vinegar and raw apple cider vinegar. Um, and then at bottling, uh, we sweetened it. But part of the reason also that the shrubs were really um, attractive to me is because when I learned the science behind it, because I told you all these pressures on not having enough cold storage space and freezer storage, I could do the shrubs at room temperature because of the vinegar. So the vinegar would preserve the fruit juice so I could get that fruit juice out of my freezer and have it um, at room temperature in big IBC tanks. So that's still what we do today. We make sure we have the mother of vinegar in there so that if there are any residual sugars that ferment into alcohol in that process, the mother of vinegar eats it and turns the acetobacter in the science, anybody interested in science, food science here, um, eats it and then basically converts it back into vinegar so that they are shelf stable. Um, and then when we go to bottle, we add sugar and we bottle it and it becomes a sweet and sour syrup. Um, but that was a really great also story of our use of um, um, uh, using something that otherwise would have been wasted, which was essentially how the business was started. You know, we started making jam with fruit that would have been wasted. Um, and the bitters are also an expression of that. Um, the bitters are essentially these tinctures. We take the final byproducts of our preserving process. So literally we mill a lot of fruit for the cutting preserves and the mill spits out like seeds and stems and pips like woodsy bits. Well, we macerate that in a locally distilled apple brandy, uh, which gives it bittering agents, lots of flavor, interesting aromas and profiles and that has become our bitters project. Um, so we're ex extracting more flavor out of that um, and the winery, there's also an example this year, um, uh, we are pressing most of the, so the, so the wine project is we're taking um, orchard fruit, not grapes, because grapes don't really grow well in the islands, and there's certainly not enough of them to make commercial wine. But I had had a few years ago this apple wine that was not sweet out of Vermont um, by a company called Fable, and it blew my mind, and I thought, God, those are really cool people that are making something really interesting. And it kind of sat in my mind, and I drink more over the years, and then two, a year and a half ago, I was like, you know what, like, I can, I taught myself to make jam, I can teach myself to make wine. Um, and it was at a point where we were facing all these challenges, and I needed something, I needed a little kick, I needed some new inspiration, I needed some new material. Um, so I, I am the winemaker right now, back to being, you know, I'm not the jam maker anymore, although it was for the past two months, because we have a labor shortage. Um, <laughs> but it was really fun to be the maker again, um, and I taught myself how to ferment things. It was all completely natural, so we're using orchard fruit from the islands, apples, pears, uh, essentially pressing them for cider and then letting them spontaneously ferment the alcohol out, and we bottle them before they're finished ferment fermenting. It's a style called Method Ancestral, also known as Petit Lot Natural Pet Nap. It's the oldest form of sparkling wine, which also fits into kind of our, um, our marketing and our branding and our ethic. Um, but you, you use some chemistry um, to measure the sugar and you bottle it at a certain point where there are some sugars left to ferment in the bottle. So the yeast eat the sugars, release carbon dioxide, naturally add spritzer to the wine. So we'll have this um, we'll line, a couple of um, bone dry sparkling fruit wines that we'll be launching in the spring. Um, but on the environmental sensibility piece of that, there's something called piquette, um, which I also just stumbled upon when I was reading about learning how to make wine. Um, and piquette was what the wineries in France used to make for their um, workers. Uh, they would press the grapes once and make the wine and age it, and then the pomace, or the leftover grape skins, they would rehydrate, and they would press it again and let that ferment, and it would res result in a lower ABV alcohol by volume Y. They would then serve to the staff. Um, but given this ethic in the food culture right now, which is about like reuse and repurposing, um, I stumbled upon Piquette and I was like, oh man, we have so much like fodder for making. 
um, piquette. And with the wine, too, like we have so much um, just fruit. I hate to call it waste, because we try not to have very little waste. And what waste we do um, have, uh, literally the only waste we have, I think, is zested lemon rinds. Um, any fruit pulp and, and, and bits that we don't use um, to make something else, we have farmers come and pick it up locally and they feed it to their pigs. Uh, but literally, the only thing that goes in the garbage is zested lemon rinds because we use the zest, we use the unzested ones. Um, but with the piquette, so the piquette essentially, we we bought a big bladder press to to press off ciders, both for the shrubs um, and also for the wine project. We had lots of spent apple mash and pear mash and pear cores, so we just started throwing it in a tank and we put some beautiful Orcus well water runoff from Turtleback and Constitution and let it sit and it spontaneously fermented, and then we just kept adding, we kept pressing. This was over the course of, um, we started this in October, and we just bottled it um, this week, um, and just kept adding to it. So it was this rolling, spontaneous ferment where essentially we were putting what would otherwise be waste <laughs> and bringing in flavors, um, and then we pressed it off uh, and allowed it to age in some neutral oak barrels, um, and then we just bottled it this week when it still has, we dosed it with a little bit of Northwest honey so that it had some sugar to eat up while it was in the bottle. Um, but that's a great expression of um, making something out of nothing that we're really excited about. That's great. Padan. 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 Satan Padan. It's a crossword puzzle word. It's a good one. Yeah, it's a good one. It's going to show up like this Sunday in the New York Times. I bet. That's where it works for me. Uh, you have a question. So, how do you take jam making on your stove without pectins, which is art and science, and scale that into a palletized business? I mean, how, how do you control for quality with that? Yeah, really, really great, great question. And um, I've actually really been deep diving into this question. We, we've clearly scaled before that, but um, I've been deep diving into it the past two months. Uh, so. We've actually been operating on the same six burners the entire time. So I have six stock pot burners lined up beneath a 10 foot hood and we call them turns. We just turn the burners. So there's always six pots going at once, um, but they're going constantly. And we are using the same six copper pots, French made Mavier copper pots. They're about, yay big. They're not that big. Each pot yields about 26 jars of jam. And so we do 26 times six, and that's a turn, and we just keep them rolling and turning. It is extremely labor intensive, extremely hands-on, um, probably not that smart, but somehow we've made it work. Um, and what's interesting about the past couple of months is so because of the labor shortage, um, I've been pulling my hair out for six months now doing everything, and for the first time in five years, I spent the past two months making the jam. Um, because we just literally could not find someone skilled to come in and make the jam. Uh, we also then had my production manager resign, so I was making the jam and then managing the rest of the production team um, through fruit season and trying to run the business. Um, really trying times, but in hindsight, um, I'm really glad that it happened because I was in the kitchen every single day and whereas I had been looking for this production manager to come in and solve all my problems um, and help me scale and help my kept it just, for two years, I just felt like we were stalled. Like we needed to make more. We needed to make more every day and I couldn't seem to get anybody to do that. Well, we finally did that when I got in the kitchen um, because I was turning the pots and I rewrote all of our recipes like down to the after five minutes, like check this, if A then B, if you know, do this then that. Um, retooled our entire recipe book. Um, also put like time to myself, time to everything. Uh, we're, we're, we're still super labor dependent, but we're a little bit more of a well-oiled machine now. Um, so what I ended up doing is putting in a plan for exactly how long everything takes. I broke down all of our recipes based on um, you know, how many turns are expected to do in one day, how long the day is. We've been trying to add a, set, a sixth operating day. We only operate five days a week. Um, so to make the best use of our facility, we still aren't using it at night, we're not using it in split shifts, we're not using it on weekends. Um, so I knew we needed to make that change, but labor kept holding us back from that. Um, we were finally able to re-strategize a little bit this past month, only um, hired two women over 65, hired, you know, um, 
the moms with kids in school just really like opened our eyes to like we had been looking at you need to be 8 a.m. to 4:30 p.m. That's our shift. So really just started to experiment with some flexibility, um, split shifts, part time. We always used to favor full time jam makers, and then when I started doing it myself again, I was like, this is flipping hard. <laughs> Like, nobody wants to do this 40 hours a week and still have a smile on their face. So I was like, I'm actually, I decided I'm not hiring a full-time jam maker. I won't hire a full-time jam maker. They can be full-time, but we're going to rotate them through different tasks. So we started rotating everyone through different tasks. I hired five new jam makers who are all part-time, um, and I spent the past two weeks training them. And it's amazing. We literally doubled our production overnight. Overnight, um, I was really proud. On Wednesday, Wednesday of this week, it was the first day I let the trainees go, and you know the the one rolling eight hour production shift we yielded fifteen hundred jars of jam. And I was like, that's what we're supposed to be doing, and it was it was really rewarding to 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 see that on those six pots we can actually do that. So we st we still have room. We still have room to scale because we're still only um, operating like fifty five hours a week out of the space. Excellent. All right. So I'd say we have time for one more question. And I think there was someone had their hand up over here. Um, your hands are on so much business. Do you also do the marketing and the advertising? Why do you ask, Teresa? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yes, <laughs> is the short answer. Um, that's actually what I really like. Uh, I mean, I, I began the business and I loved the making, right? And then I was like, but I don't want to be doing this a year from now. Um, and I, do, I don't want to be hands-on on the, on the making all the time. So we do, actually, can I, can I use this as a pitch? We are hiring a production manager, full-time, benefited, salaried position, Orcas Island, spread the word, start immediately. Um, good money. Uh, yeah, so hiring a production manager still. Um, I, uh, I, I, so I talk about my responsibilities. I'm, I'm the OG, I'm the CEO, I am the CMO and the CFO. I do all the finance myself still too. So I have a finance, marketing, uh, and production management and jam making when needed. Um, we don't do any paid advertising, so there isn't a lot of that, although this year um, I am considering, uh, I'm gonna be interviewing some digital marketing firms to, like I said, throw some money at that so that I don't have to play with it myself. I feel like I'd be too dangerous if I started doing Google marketing strategies. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I do, I do Instagram, it's me, if you ever want to say hi, just DM me on Instagram. Uh, my sales manager does Facebook, I do have a sales manager, so she assists with uh, marketing efforts, um, and she's the one who actually like will show her face at a lot of events around the region and stuff, and she does, she manages. Back before COVID, we had a pretty robust demo program, so we would outsource and hire, um, you know, 1099 contractors to do demos in the grocery stores. I, I try not to do that. I like doing the bigger events. I do trade shows myself still. Um, it sounds like I do a lot, but I really still do the things that I like to do, and I try to delegate the things that I don't when I am able, <laughs> when there's not a nationwide labor shortage. <laughs> All right, well, uh, before we close out, I wanted to make two quick announcements that I meant to make in the beginning. One is, on um, March 4th, right here, you're gonna be able to come back and hear our undergraduate students present their solutions to the Jones Idea Challenges. And uh, so come back and hear that. And then also, uh, you know, we've kicked off the uh, business plan competition and registrations are open. So hopefully some of you students will be in, inspired by Audra and will compete in that. And uh, you can register for that now. Uh, but uh, what a great night and I'm so glad you all came and please give a, a, a warm thank you to Audra.